Hello, thank you for watching this video. So in this video, we'll be doing question 5 of May 20, 2023 question paper, Physical Sciences Paper 1. The topic is work energy and power. So I'll read question 5 statement and then answer the questions that follow. So let's go. They are saying, an electric motor pulls a 20 kg crate from rest at point A up an inclined plane by means of a light and extensible rope. The inclined plane makes an angle of 18 degrees with the horizontal. B C and D are points on the inclined plane and the distance between A and C is 15.6 meters as shown in the diagram. The motor exert, exerts a constant force of 96.8 newtons parallel to the inclined plane on the rope. A constant frictional force of 13.5 newton acts on the grid as it moves up on the inclined plane. Let me read this thing again. They are saying, an electric motor pulls a 20 kg crate from rest at point A up an inclined plane by means of a light and extensible rope. rope. The inclined plane makes an angle of 18 degrees with the horizontal. B, C and D are points on the inclined plane and the distance between points A and C is 15.6 meters as shown in the diagram. They went on to say, the motor exerts a constant force of 96.8 newtons parallel to the inclined plane on the rope. A constant frictional force of 13.6 acts on the crate as it moves up on the inclined plane. So, let's try to see what they are talking about, right? So, they are saying, you have this electric motor that is pulling this 20 kg crate up the slope, right? And this slope of yours, you can see the slope, it makes an angle of 18 degrees with the horizontal. Right, so they went on to say that you have points B, C, and D that are on this slope of yours, and you're told the distance between C and A is 15.6 meters. Right, and then they also went on to say that the magnitude of the force applied by the electric motor on this crane to pull it up is 96.8 newtons, and the magnitude of the frictional force acting. On the block, on the 20 kg block, as it goes up or as it moves up the incline, is 13.5 newtons. That's what they're telling us, essentially. No problem. Then, let's go to the questions. So, 5.1. Define a non-conservative force. So, what is a non-conservative force? Forces are grouped as conservative forces as or non-conservative forces. Right? So, a conservative force... Is the force that does the work, but the work it does does not depend on the path taken. It's independent of the path that is taken by the object from point A to point B, right? So it doesn't consider the entire path taken by to move from point A to point B. What it focuses on is A and B, right? But if you look at a non-conservative force, a non-conservative force, the work it does depends on the path taken. The longer the path the greater the work done, right? But on the non -conserv on the conservative forces, the path is not a problem. It's just focus from the start and finish and see what is in between. That's what a conservative, fo conservative force really focuses on. It focuses on the, start and, on, the, on the starting point and the end point. But a non-conservative force, the work it does depends on the path taken. The smaller the path, the, lo the, the lower or the less were done by that force but the larger the, fo the path which is the larger they were done by the force so it, it focuses on the entire path taken by the object from point a to point b so let me write it down so in 5.1 i'm going to try to define a non-conservative force a non-conservative force force is the force Right, which the work it does depend on the path taken. Right, you know, this force is, for example, frictional force is one example, and uh. Applied force as well. Then, 
an example of a, a, a non-conservative force, a, a conservative force, these are non-conservative forces, of course. As an example of a conservative force is gravitational force. So the, the work done by gravitational force is independent of the path taken. Just looks at the starting position and the finishing position. Then it will work with that vertical height. If how long it took to get, what was maybe the, in, the, the slamming height to get to a certain height, gravity does not care about that. It wants the start and the finish, then that's it. So a non-conservative force is a force is the force which the work it does, right? The work it does, it should be I. It does depend on the path taken. The work done by a non-conservative force is path dependent, and the work done by a conservative force is path independent. Done. Then we move to the next question, which is 5.2, I think. So they are saying, use the energy principles to calculate the speed of the crate when it reaches point C. So they want us to use the energy principles to calculate the speed of this crate when it reaches point C. That's what they want us to do. They want us to find the speed at point C. Use the energy principles. So you can use the conservation of mechanical energy or you can use the work energy theorem. So I'll use the work energy theorem which states that there's no need to state it but I'm being extra which states that the work uh, the work energy theorem states that the net work done on an object by what? by the net force is equal to the change in kinetic energy of an object. So the work energy theorem which I'm going to use, this states that the network done on an object right by the net force is equal to the change in kinetic energy of that object so which means the work net done on an object is equal to the change in kinetic energy of an object so in this case the, the network done by the net force right is responsible for the change in kinetic energy of an object. It causes the change in kinetic energy of an object. The work net is the work done by the net force, right? So you know the net force, F net, is the sum of two or more forces acting on an object. Object. Of course, it will depend which forces are you talking about. Because of course, there might be forces that you are particularly interested in. Right? So, if you are saying the network done on an object by the net force, so this network, this work net, is done by the net, net force. Right? So, you define your work to be, what is it? You say is um, force times the displacement, times the cosine of the angle between them, right? No problem. So if you want the network, it should be the net force, right? Like you see here. So if you want the work net, it should be the F net times the displacement. Because the work net, right, is the work done by the net force. Because you have your net force times the displacement, that gives you the work net, right? So, in simple terms, you say the work net, the work net done on an object by the net force is equal to the change in kinetic energy of an object. So that work net done by the net force causes the change in kinetic energy of an object. That is what this theorem is saying. So, 
in simple terms. So we said, okay, what net is equal to the change in kinetic energy, right? But what is this? This is the net force times the displacement, right? Is equal to the change in kinetic energy of an object. What is the change in kinetic energy? Is final is um, final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy, right? But what are your net? What is your net force? Right? Now the question becomes, what is your net force? Then, that's when you come to this object here. Right? That's when you come to this object of yours, which is object A, and try to find the net force that is responsible for the change in kinetic energy. And you know, those forces are the forces that are parallel to the slope. Because you know the perpendicular forces are not doing any work. The work they do is zero jobs. Right? Because the perpendicular forces, if you were to draw the free body diagram of, of, of the 20 kg block, let's draw the free body diagram of the 20 kg block. It looks like this. So say, okay, the 20 kg block looks like this. You have the applied force. You have the frictional force. You have the normal force. And you have gravitational force, which I'm going to split into components which is the parallel component and the perpendicular component. So you have the perpendicular component and you have a parallel component, which is equal to mg sine theta. And this one is equal to mg cos theta. No problem. So now the forces that we're interested in here when we're finding our net force, because I said the net force is the sum of two or more forces that are acting on an object. Of course, the force that were, you would have specific forces that you are interested in. In this case, you want the forces that are responsible for the change in kinetic energy of an object. Right? But the perpendicular ones, this one and this one, are not doing any work because perpendicular forces are doing zero hours of work. So the forces that are responsible for the change in kinetic energy are the ones that are parallel to the slope, which is what? The frictional force, the parallel component of gravity, and the applied force. So which means that net force is made up of these three forces. So which means our F net times this, our F net will be those forces there. So our F net, F net is equal to, which will be your force applied minus your frictional force minus your parallel component of gravity, which is also energy sine theta. Right? So, if you want to use this energy principle, the work energy theorem, which is this one here, on your net force, this is what you're substituting. Because this is your net force. So, what you say, let's have our net force there. Say, Fa minus FF minus Fg parallel times delta X is equal to the change in kinetic energy, right? Which is half M half m, we have squared, minus half m, vi squared, <coughs> right? So what do we do? We say, okay, this is the force applied, right? Minus frictional force, minus mg parallel, fg parallel, which is mg sine theta, times the displacement delta x is equal to this thing. We can take, because uh, I won't have much space, so I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. So I'll take half m as a common factor. Half m, so inside the left will be f squared minus v i squared. Right? Then, on this we can substitute our values now because what we want, what we want, we want the final velocity where? The final velocity at c, right? We have the force applied. We have, because we're given the force applied to be that, 96.8, right? And we're given the frictional force to be 13.5 newtons and we can calculate the we can calculate, we have ms we have gravitational acceleration and we have the angle which is 18 degrees there then you can find this final velocity that you're looking for there what is your force applied it's 96.8 right 96.8 minus this is in a bracket because it's multiplying displacement 
minus a frictional force, which is 13.5, minus mg, which is 20, times 9.8, sine 18 degrees. Sine of 18 degrees. This is your net force that you have inside here. Then times the displacement, which is what? Which is, your displacement is 15.6, I think. So it's 15, 0.6 is equal to this. What is this? It's half of your mass, which is 20, times your final velocity, which is what you're looking for, minus your initial velocity, which was zero, because the box was coming from rest. Right? There. Because this, this net force times this is equal to this thing here. Then we punch this on our calculator and see what we get. Say 96.8 minus 13.5 minus 20 times 9.8 times sine 18 degrees sine 18 degrees times 15.6 so this is equal to 354 uh, 354.63 uh, is equal to half of 20 is 10 V F squared because this is zero. Then divide by 10, divide by 10. So V F squared is equal to take uh, you divide by 10. So you get that this is 35.46. Then take the square root, take the square root. So your final velocity is equal to the answer to this, right? Square root to this, answer this. So this is 5.96 meters per second. So they wanted, they said they wanted the, the speed. So this is the magnitude, which is what they wanted. So we have the speed. And at this point here, uh, at this point here, let's see, this final velocity will be 5.96 meters per second. We have that. And I hope it does make sense to you, as it does to me. So I'll move to the next question, which is 5.3. So I'll clean all this work, and then we do 5.3. At least we have our velocity, which we didn't have. The only new, thing, new information here. So let's clean the board and go to the next questions. Okay, so now we're doing 5.3. So 5.3, read as follow. Calculate the minimum average power dissipated by the electric motor to pull the crate from point A to point C. Right? So they want us to calculate the minimum average power dissipated by the electric motor to pull the crate from point A to point B. What is power? Power. Power. Is the rate at which work is the rate at which work is done right it is the rate at which work is done and you know your work is called what it's called your force times your displacement right right um we can say your cost theta maybe over time so this is your work and this is your time so if you simplify this you can see that this is the angle between the displacement. This is the angle between the displacement and, and your force, of course. So you have F cos theta times your displacement over time. But if you look at these two, this uh, ratio here, if you have F times cos theta, which is the angle between the two vectors, delta x, over delta t, you can see that this is the average velocity, what you have here. So you have your, your power to be called your force times your average, uh, your average velocity, your average velocity. This is the force times average velocity. If you notice, I have written this thing here. Because I haven't been using it clearly. 
but I'll, I'll show you. I'll, I'll use, I've been using it actually, but I haven't been showing it much. It's been there. So this is four times the average velocity. So now this is the force applied by the motor times the average velocity of the, of the 20 kg block. So the 20 kg block, the force applied by the electric motor is 96.8. No problem with it. The average velocity is the average velocity between the two points A and C. So if you want your average velocity, if you want your average velocity between point A and C, it will be, you know how to find average. Between two points, it will be velocity, and uh, it will be velocity at A, plus velocity at C, divided by two. That's your average velocity. So if you want the power, so your power is called your force applied times the average velocity, right? Which is equal to the force applied times the average velocity, which is what? Which is the velocity at A plus your velocity at C all over two. That's how you find average between two points. Then say your power is equal to your force, which is what? 96.8, right? It is 96.8 times your average velocity, which is velocity at A, which was zero, plus velocity at C. At C, we said it's 5.96, all divided by two. So your power is equal to the answer to this. So what do you say? You say 96.8 times 5.96 divided by two. So you get that your power is equal to 288.46 watts. We're done with this one. Then we'll move to the next question. So the, the, the key was just finding the average, you know, identifying the average there. So let's move. So they want to say. When the crate reaches point C, the rope breaks, right? The, continue, the crate continues to move up the inclined plane, comes to rest at point D, and then slides down the plane out, then slides down the plane past point B. So they say that this electric motor pulled this block, pulled this block upwards, right? And then when the block got here, the rope snapped. So it was disconnected, right? So what happened afterwards? Because of its kinetic energy when it arrived at C, the block went up, or because of its inertia, depending on how you want to, to say it. Because of its inertia, or kinetic energy, or momentum, the block continued to go up until it reaches point D, right? And then its velocity was zero here. And then after this, the block slided back down. That's what happened. But they are saying, when the crater reaches point C, the rope breaks. So which means, when the block was here at point C, the rope was snapped, break, no problem. They say the crate continues, move, continues moving up the plane, come to stop at D. So with its initial kinetic energy that it had at C, it managed to move from A up until D, right? No problem. And then slides down past a past B. So after getting to this point, the crate went down and moved past B. That's what happened. So the crate was pulled when it got here. The rope broke, but because of its initial its, its initial kinetic energy at C, it continued going up until it reached its maximum height at D, and then slided down afterwards past B. So it, it yeah, that's what happened. So, now, we're going to the real question. So at 5.4, they're saying, draw a label free body diagram for the crate as it slides down past point B. So they want you to write down, to draw a free body diagram when it was passing point B, which is when it was sliding down. That's what they wanted to do. No problem. Not difficult, 5.4. I said, okay, this is our thing, right? So we know that we had a normal force there because the force of the surface on the block and then we had frictional force on this object, right? Is it 
because you know this the slope is not smooth so it was going down there was frictional force on the slope on this block and then now we have gravitational force which you can just pull it down but i don't like it like that i like the components so this is the parallel component and the perpendicular component so i like using components more because I think they are very, they make my calculations very easy. They are easy to remember when I write them on the triple diagram. No problem. So now, 5.5. Okay, so now we're going to do 5.5. So, 5.5 read as follow. Draw a velocity time graph for the entire motion of the crate, starting from point A until it passes point B again, on its motion down the inclined plane. So they want us to draw the velocity time graph of this entire motion. No problem. So, uh -huh. Uh -huh. so we say, let's say we have our velocity here in meters per second. And we have our time here in seconds, right? So its initial velocity was what? Its initial velocity was zero here, right? At A, this is point A here. This velocity was zero here at point A. At point B, actually, at point B, at point C, we know this velocity was 5.96 at point C. 5.96. And we know this at C, know at C the velocity was 5.96, which is that. So this is your C. So I'll say B is somewhere in between. So is it? Right? And then what happened after that? At point C, the rope snapped, right? It, 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 the rope was broken. So it continued going up to D. But as it was going to D, D, its final velocity D was zero again because it came to stop at D before sliding back down. So we know between C and D, the velocity was decreasing to, towards zero because you see the velocity is zero there. So I'll say this is my D here. The velocity was decreasing up until it got to zero because the box came and rested zero a d its velocity was zero there and then what happened after that it then slided down which means it was gaining velocity again but in different direction which is down slope now so which means the velocity was increasing but i won't say increase, i won't increase this side because if i increase this side which means it's a positive side which means it looks like it's continuing up slope but because it's going downwards, so the change in, there's a change in direction, so it should continue downwards. So I'll say it looks something like this after that. You can have your B somewhere here and maybe your C somewhere here again. Because it will pass, it will go past C again before it went to D. So I think this is how this graph should look like. Or something similar to this. And I hope it does make sense to you. As it does to me. So I'll go to the next question, which is the Doppler effect. Thank you for watching. Cheers.